recording started. And welcome to Monday, April 5th, was our elementary statistics class. And today we're going to talk about a famous distribution called the chi square distribution. That's pronounced chi as it's almost like K A I squared or square. It's written with a Greek lowercase letter called chi. And this is a lowercase chi. You don't need a lesson in Greek. Uppercase chi looks like an X. So it's kind of like the Greek X. And if you translate it into English letters, it would be C-H-I. So the chi-squared distribution is often written like this, chi-squared. Or, and it's, it's a little bit like this T distribution that it depends on degrees of freedom. So some people also write it chi-squared with the degrees of freedom indicated here in the lower right subscript. So that's our goal today. It's kind of a fun test. It's kind of uh, actually very informative, but you might be also surprised about the limitations that it has too. It's used in cases of goodness of fit and tests for independence in the probabilistic sense. So before we get started on that, let me just remind you that you're working on your second exam. There were six questions on that exam. They are due, it's like the first exam by 11.59 p.m. This time the due date is Tuesday, April 6. So you have office hours later today and tomorrow if you want to ask questions about this in uh, more detail and I can answer whatever, I'll answer whatever questions I can before you submit it on Tuesday, April 6. So then I'll try and grade it and turn it around, get it back to you as fast as possible. Your next written homework Remember, you don't have any written homework to submit on Tuesday because you're working on the test. Your next written homework number 10 is posted right now. And it's due by 11.59 p.m. on April 13. So you have another week to work on the next paper. And the next homework is specifically about what we're talking about today and this week, the chi-square distribution. Okay, one more reminder. In Newton Alta assignments that you've been working on this semester, they do have a final due date because you're coming up against the end of the semester, maybe sooner than you expect. So this is week 13. If you look at our website, then we have week 14 and 15. And then the last week, we're just doing an exam, our last exam. So you have three more weeks of work left in the course. So the Newton Alta assignments, one through 30, the final due date is Monday, April 26. That's three weeks from today. So if you have to catch up in those, then make sure that you're spending the time you need inside that. Okay, other than that, everything else is operating as normal. I think I'll bring up my webpage just for a second to show you the last topics that we're gonna talk about in the course before I show you the examples today. So let me share this website with you. We're looking at the website, you're looking at the website, good. And 
So make sure everybody sees it at a decent size here. So we're inside Mass 208. And this is week 13. But just looking at the whole semester right here. Let's look at these last four weeks. I'm going to talk about several sections this week, but they're not long sections, so don't be too concerned. And then we will open a famous topic called linear regression on Wednesday, and we'll finish it next week. And then we have one more distribution to learn, the F distribution, and a technique called ANOVA, which is an abbreviation for analysis of variations. So all kinds of math classes are littered with abbreviations. And then our last week of the course, April 25 to May 1, that's going to be done just like before, review and exam. Now, I don't have the luxury of letting you take the exam into the next week. So we're gonna to have to be careful about this. We might release the last exam at the end of week 15. And I'll have to work on the timing of that exactly because the college requires instructors to hand in grades at a particular day. So we'll do more about that. We'll talk more about that later, exactly what the timing is of the last exam. But essentially it's gonna be looking very much like the first two exams, Let's see if we have to make any adjustments on the timing. Let me get out of the screen share right here and back to our paper. And let's talk about the chi-square distribution. So take stock of the distributions that you've used so far. Standard normal distribution, kind of like a bell-shaped curve. And we have the T distribution, which is also like a bell-shaped curve. But it's a little bit fatter in the tails. I'm exaggerating here a great deal. But the T distribution also looks like a bell-shaped curve centered at the origin, but it's a little bit wider and a little bit shorter. Still, it's very hard to tell these two apart unless you look at a particular example. I'll give you a drawing in a second. But the T distribution, actually there are many, many T distributions, as you know, depends on the number of degrees of freedom involved. And as degrees of freedom increase, The T distribution looks more and more like the standard normal distribution. Remember the notation we use for the standard normal distribution. Normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's called the standard normal distribution. So on the whole, these don't look very different. The chi-square distribution looks entirely different. And it's a new idea right here. It's a little bit like the t-distribution and is that you have distributions for different degrees of freedom, but it's a strictly right-hand distribution. It starts at zero and it kind of grows into a mound and then tails off slowly. So this is a picture of an example. This is an example of a chi-squared distribution. They almost always look like this. They are what you might call right skewed. That means they are tilted towards the right-hand side. And the mean of the chi-square distribution can't be zero like standard normal distribution, t-distribution. 
the mean is the same as the number of degrees of freedom. So if the degrees of freedom is seven, the mean is seven. And the mean is always slightly to the, well, it's generally slightly to the right. It's to the right of the peak of the distribution, but it might be closer depending on the situation. Here's the peak right here. The mean is always slightly to the right of that. It also has a standard deviation that depends on the degrees of freedom. And the standard deviation is the square root of two times the degrees of freedom. You double the degrees of freedom and then you take the square root. I'm gonna show you several distributions on the calculator, but as time goes on, it's like the T distribution that as the degrees of freedom increase, the chi-squared distribution, if you'd like to learn how to write a nice Greek lowercase chi, kind of like an X. Don't make it an X, make a wiggly line like this, you know, kind of up, down, up, and then put a straight line through it like that. That looks like a Greek letter chi. As the degrees of freedom increase, the chi square distribution looks more and more like the standard distribution, standard normal distribution. Well, I should say it this way, not centered away from the origin, like a normal distribution. So let me take you to the calculator and illustrate these side by side. T distribution is a little bit wider than the standard normal distribution. And as the degrees of freedom increase, these two look almost the same. The chi-squared distribution is right skewed, but as the degrees of freedom increase, it looks like a normal distribution, not the standard normal distribution because the mu is not gonna be at zero. Let's pop over to our calculator for a second. And I have to be a little bit careful because there's some screen lag going on. So I apologize for that. We got a recording going too. So let me clear my screen. Let me go in the Y equals menu and clear the screen too. And let me put two distributions right here side by side. And from the distribution key, Let's do the standard normal distribution, normal probability distribution function. And we'll use X to graph it with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, paste. Okay, let's take a window right here and graph this minus four to four. This looks pretty good. Oh, okay, that's standard normal distribution in blue. And I've got this other thing drawn here that I got to get rid of, right? I, I realized I didn't tell you exactly how to get rid of a previous drawing on there if it's not in the Y equals menu. How do you get rid of this red drawing? You can go to the second function. Let me clear my screen here. You can go to the second function format key and say, there's got to be a button here that says clear drawing. And that's kind of funny because I had it on my screen on my other calculator a second ago. Let me pull up my other calculator in my hand. Clear mode format. Oh, okay. I see what button I'm looking for. I'm looking for this draw button. So let me get out of here, clear this so you don't see this again. Let's look at the 
draw button and not the program button. <laughs> okay. Now again, it's I'm working the keyboard on the calculator from the keys on my keypad of my computer, which is awkward. Okay, let's try it again. Second function, draw, clear drawing. That erases the whole drawing window. Doesn't erase any of the things you store, just erase the drawing window. So when I clear the drawing and the calculator says done, now I can go back to the graph and just draw the standard normal distribution. Okay, good. Let's compare that to a T distribution with a small value of T. And I'll bring up the distribution menu again. And let's go to a T probability distribution function, number five. X value for graphing is gonna be the X, excuse me. And let's say degrees of freedom is three or four. Let's paste that. And graph this in red. T distribution in red, standard normal distribution in blue. Do you see that the T distribution is, if, you, if the blue one wasn't there, you would think that T distribution was like a standard normal distribution, except the tails are a little bit higher, wider, and the mound is a little bit shorter. Let me increase that degrees of freedom to eight. And you see that now they're gonna be very close together. You can still see a slight difference between the red one and the blue one. The red is slightly shorter, the tails are slightly wider. Now let's pump that up seriously. Let's say that I had 20 degrees of freedom or 30 degrees of freedom. Here's the standard normal distribution. Here's the T distribution. Yeah, it might be a little bit wider. It might be a little bit shorter, but it looks like standard normal distribution. And that's what I mean by saying that as the number of degrees of freedom increase, the T distribution looks more and more like the standard normal distribution. Now let's pull up the chi-square distribution. So I got a normal distribution here. Let me erase the T distribution. And let me bring up the chi-square distribution. Also under distribution, it's a little bit farther down. Number seven, the chi-squared probability distribution function. So I'll take number seven and X and, excuse me, X right here. And I'll show you some different degrees of freedom, like try the standard, I, I did T distribution with four, let's do four here and graph it. There's a standard normal distribution. Here comes the T distribution. It's like a mound that takes a long time to descend. Let me change the window. Let me change the window to minus eight to 12. There's a standard normal distribution center at the origin. There's the chi-square distribution. Let's increase the degrees of freedom. Let's make the degrees of freedom six. Watch how the chi-square distribution uh, kind of mellows out at the beginning. Now, the mean is at six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll show you where the mean is here on the screen. The mean of the chi-square distribution is around six, so it's slightly to the right of that bump. And the standard deviation is the square root of two times the degrees of freedom. So if this mound has degrees of freedom, six, and two times that is 12, and the degrees of freedom is the square root of 12, which is somewhere around 3.4 or something. 
So that's the standard deviation. Let's pump up the degrees of freedom much higher. And notice as I do that, the mound will get smaller and this will be spread out, but it'll look more and more like a standard normal distribution. Let's pump this up to 20. Now I graph this, but I'm gonna have a serious problem that it doesn't get started till near 20, right? So I'm gonna to have to extend this x-axis quite a bit. So I'm gonna, in a sense, lose the standard normal distribution here because it's gonna get scrunched up at the origin. Remember the mean of the chi-squared distribution is mu. So if I just made mu 20, then I need to show you all the way out to 20 just to find the middle of this thing. I think I have to go all the way out to 40 or 50. So let's go from minus four to 50. Now the problem with that, there's the normal distribution in blue, is that the chi-squared distribution is so much shorter. So let's look at the chi distribution, chi-squared distribution in red. Let me turn off the normal distribution. You turn off a function just by going over the equal sign, hitting enter, and that turns it off. Let's look at this red bump here. That almost looks like a normal distribution, right? Now let's adjust the height so I can see more of the height. And this window is marked in four marks. Let's find out what the marks are. Zero to 0.5 by one. I think I have to make this, let's say, 0.1, 0, 0.1, and let's make this from 0, 0.1 to that, counting by 0, 0.1. Now let's graph it. You can still see that that's bent towards the right, yes? But it's kind of like, almost like a standard normal distribution. Now remember I said the mean is 20. So if I show you where 20 is on this curve, 20 is about in here. That's almost at the top of the mound. So the mean is slightly right. And twice 20 is 40, square root of 40. Oh, it's about six something. So the standard deviation is like plus or minus six right here. But let's put a normal distribution of mean 20 on top of this, of mean 20 and standard deviation square root of 40. Let's put that right on top of that. So I'll adjust this normal distribution to be mean 20. Now not standard deviation one, that's not gonna look very good, right? But I want it to spread out like the red curve spread out. So if the red curve's normal distribution is square root of 40, let's make this normal distribution, square root of 40. I just erased that thing. Okay, so I gotta go back to get my normal distribution, value x and mean 20 and square root of 40 for my sigma. And now let's draw that. Do you see the chi-squared distribution in red looks very much like the normal distribution. It's just kind of slowly easing out to the right. It's got a longer tail to the right. Now, in this drawing right here, we say that the red distribution is skewed right because it lasts longer on the right. You might say, oh, the red distribution looks like it's bent to the left. Well, it is, does look like it's bent to the left, but it's called skewed to the right. Let's make this even more dramatic. Let's take a chi-square distribution of, oh, let's say mean 100. Let's take it mean 50. Because what's the standard deviation if the mean is 50? Two times 50 is 100, standard deviation is 10. 
So let's look at this graph. That's the other standard deviation I don't need. Now here's mean 50. See, it's running off the screen. So I got to now make the screen like 0 to 100 or 0 to 120. Let's try that. 0 to 120. Let's count by tens. I'm having a trouble hitting a two here for some reason. Let's count by tens. Okay. Now I'm going to turn off the normal distribution, but before I turn it off, let's adjust it. So its mean is 50. And remember two times 50 is a hundred and the square root of a hundred is 10. So, if I inserted square root of 100 instead of 40 right here, these two distributions should look very similar. I'm going to turn this one off for a second, and let's just graph chi-squared distribution. There's the chi-squared distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. You still say it's kind of stretched out to the right, but let's compare it with a standard normal distribution of a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So let's turn on the standard norm or the normal distribution here. Graph that. Yeah, you know what? They they are definitely different. Let me. Put this window a little bit lower so I can see more of the graph. They are definitely different, but they're looking more and more the same, right? You see this chi-squared has a longer right tail, has a shorter left tail. Okay, so this is the purpose of a chi-squared distribution. Now, under your distribution functions, you can draw the normal distribution. You can draw, that's number one. You can draw the T distribution, that's number five. Or you can draw the chi-squared distribution, that's number seven. If you want to add up the area under the normal distribution, you use the normal cumulative distribution function. If you want to add up the area under a T distribution, you use the T cumulative distribution function. You can likewise add up the area under the chi-squared distribution with the chi-squared cumulative distribution function. Let me go back to this graph, turn off the normal distribution, and have you graph the chi-squared distribution from 0 to 120. Remember, the mean is 50. How about how much area is between 40 and 60 on this graph? I could show you on the graph by calculating the area approximately from 40 to 60 and shading it. That's 0 0.6859. If you round off to four decimal places, 6860. Let me throw that graph over here on the right. But I could also use the cumulative distribution function from the distribution menu and say, what's the cumulative distribution under the chi-squared distribution from 40 to 60 and degrees of freedom is 50. Use that just like you use the T cumulative distribution function, six, eight, Five nine rounded off to four decimal places, 6860. So you can see that on this graph, or you can see it using the cumulative distribution function here. Now let me go back to the graph. I'm going to use the chi-squared distribution function the same way I use the other distribution functions. I'm going to use it to measure area. And the area I measure is going to tell me how likely something is or is not. So let's do our first test. 
Let me get out of the calculator for you. And I'm going to clear that screen. Got it. Let's turn these off. Let's clear this. Good. Got some other lists here I'll show you later. It's a nice thing about using the screen calculator right here. I can show you, and let me make them approximately the same size. I can show you the equations I'm graphing in this window just by showing you another window here. It's not got super functionality. I can't show you everything I like, but here you see that I'm graphing the chi-squared distribution with a degrees of freedom of 50. And if I turn on the normal function and then graph them, you can see that I've got both functions turned on in the equation window. Normal distribution function with mean 50 and standard deviation 10, square root of 100 is 10. And here's the chi-squared distribution of mean 50 and standard deviation, two times degrees of freedom, two times 50, 100 square root is 10. So here's a comparison of chi-squared distribution to standard to normal distribution with a large number of degrees of freedom. So let's show you how an area test works like here. Let's do, I'll stop sharing the calculator. Let's do what people call a goodness of fit test. A goodness of fit test is a test for comparing two distributions. And I'm going to number my pages here <coughs> so I can copy this later. Let me give you a simple example to start out with. Well, not the first example in the section, but still a useful example. So this is example. Eleven point three in section 11.2 of the book. Remember, she numbers her examples from the beginning of each chapter. So this is example 11.3 and it occurs in section 11.2 where they're showing you how to perform these tests. Let's say that, and I'm gonna pull up this example and read it with you. So let me get the book out. Right here, slide over to my book screen and look at section 11.2. Here's example 11.3. Sometimes the formatting of the book is kind of funny. It starts on the next page. So this, I'm reading it to you, says there's a study that indicates that the number of televisions that American families have is distributed as follows. How many televisions do you have in your house? Well, typical American family. And what percentage of people have those televisions? So this is what we call an expected distribution. Here's the number of TVs. I'm writing this down on my paper so I can leave the book. Zero TVs. How many houses have zero TVs? Well, let's find out. One TV, two TVs, three TVs, four TVs, right? And over here is the percent of households with that number of TVs. 
They say 10% have no TVs. 16% have one TV. 55% have two TVs. 11% have three TVs. And 8% have four or more televisions. Now, let's take a survey of households in the Western United States. That's what the problem says. And ask these people in the Western United States, how many TVs do you have in your house? And so they did this and came up with this distribution. They asked 600 households, one, two, three, four plus televisions. And they got this result. 66 households had, sorry. This is a frequency, not a percent. 66 households had no televisions, 119. I'm gonna to go to my paper in just a second. I'm just copying down the problem. 340 had two televisions. make this a little bit easier to read because I've kind of scribbled and wrote over. 60 have three televisions and 15 households had four or more televisions. They were asking 600 people right here. Now, how does that compare to, now I'm gonna go back to my paper. How does that compare to what I expected of all US households? Well, my first problem is I'm comparing apples and oranges. Here's percentages for all US households. Here's frequencies for 600 households in the Western United States. So they kind of, yeah, the most of them have two TVs, right? But how do I compare these two lists when one is frequency and the other is percent? I have to make them both frequency. So this will be my expected frequency. And let's take as if I had 10% of 600. 10% of 600 is 60. I just multiply 10%, 0.10 times 600. So that's 60. 16% of 600 is 96. I'm just multiplying 600 times 0.16. 600 times 55% would be 330. I'm doing the multiplication here, not showing it to you on the calculator. 11% of 600 would be 66. And 8% of 600 would be 48. Now let's compare these two together. Uh, it's a little bit similar. Now I've got more in the Western United States with zero TVs. Now I've got more with one TV and much less with four plus TVs. So here's a question. Is the distribution of televisions in the Western US different than
the entire US. This might be something I want to know if I'm selling televisions or something, right? Or it might be something if I want to know if I'm advertising on televisions. This looks like a hypothesis test. Now let's write our hypothesis carefully in English first. What I want to know is really if something is different. So my hypothesis, my null hypothesis will be, no, there's nothing different. The distributions are the same. Because they look pretty close to each other. Once I compared 600 televisions to 600 televisions, maybe the only difference here is just by random chance. So what's the opposite then, or what's the contradiction to the distributions are the same? Here, our alternative hypothesis will be the distributions are different. So we need to test this. Let's just pick the ordinary 5% level of significance. So what is the probability that I will be this different than what I expected? Now it's key on the words observed and expected because here's our test statistic. Test statistic says you add up, this is a funny symbol for adding up in mathematics, it's called sum. You add up each observed value minus each expected value and you square that difference and you divide by each expected value. Now here I've got five values observed, five values expected, and I'm gonna take the difference between each one and divide by the expected number each time. So in this language of summing up this mathematical language, I'm going to check five differences squared divided by their expected value. So let me write it out. And I can have a calculator do this too, but this is not so large that I can't write it out. 66 minus 60, we'll at least write it out once, divided by 60. That's the first difference, 66 minus 60 divided by 60. Then 119 minus 96 squared divided by 96. Even with five categories, you see this takes some writing. So we're gonna have the computer or calculator automate it shortly. 340 minus 330 squared divided by 330, each time a different expected number down here, then 60 minus 66 squared divided by 66, and 15 minus 48 squared divided by 48. And if you let me simplify this a little bit, this will be six squared, which is 36 over 60. This is a larger number, 119 minus 96 is 23. If you square 23, I'm a little bit nervous that I don't wanna do this myself, but let's just square 23 on my calculator, 529. I am usually not gonna write this out by hand, but I just wanted you to see the calculations. 
340 minus 330 is 10, 10 squared is 100. 60 minus 66 is negative six, but negative six squared is still positive 36. And 15 minus 48 is what again? Now that would be 33 negative. So what's negative 33 squared? That's a larger number, 1089. I will show you how to automate this shortly. Now let me add these together on my calculator here, but I won't put this under the camera. 36 divided by 60. Since there's only five terms, I'm not so upset about typing these in. Plus 529 over 96, plus 100 over 30. I'll show you the shortcut in a second. Plus 36 over 36, or 66, excuse me, plus 1089 divided by 48. And I get 29.64. Six four, if I take it out to four decimal places. This is my test statistic. I'm going to look for the area under the chi square distribution from this point onwards. Now, what distribution am I using? What distribution do I look at the area under? Sorry, let me slide that up for you. It's going to be the chi-squared distribution. But I got to be careful about the degrees of freedom, right? Now, what is the degrees of freedom in this problem? Not the 600 households I surveyed, the number of categories minus one. So the number of categories here is five categories. So the degrees of freedom, number of categories minus one, here the degrees of freedom is four. So I wanna look under the chi-square distribution with four degrees of freedom, and I want to graph the area from 29 onwards. Now, remember the chi-square distribution has a mean of four, and the area, it's going to be like shooting up and then going out exaggerated. This is a terrible drawing. I'm going to use the calculator to draw it in a second. But let's say 29 is over here, 29.6464. What I'm interested in is how much area is under that curve. That's the p-value. I can do that directly with my chi-squared cumulative distribution function. 29.6464 forever to the right, one times 10 to the 99th, and the degrees of freedom is four. I'm gonna ask this of my calculator directly. I'll do it on the camera calculator before we go back to our screen. Calculator. So the chi-squared cumulative distribution function from 29.6464 up to infinity, essentially, 1 times 10 to the 99th, and degrees of freedom is 4. Paste. It says five, seven, six, but do you see the 10 to the minus six here? This is a very small probability. 5.776 times 10 to the minus six. That means several zeros here. That means five zeros here before 
I reached at 5776. This is the p-value. That is a very low probability. What does that mean? It's very unlikely that these distributions are actually the same. They almost look the same at two televisions, right? 330 versus 340, but noticeably different households with one television and noticeably different households with four or more televisions. So I compare p-value to alpha. My alpha is bigger. Alpha was 0 0.05. P-value was 0 0.12345 zeros with a 5.8, even rounded off there. So this is very unusual. I reject the null hypothesis. And that means, I guess I'm going to have to go to another piece of paper to do this, but let's do that so that you can see the continuity and see the writing. What does that mean to reject the null hypothesis here? There is sufficient evidence to reject the hypothesis that the distributions were the same. Or I could say there is sufficient evidence that these distributions are not the same. So remember when you're stating your conclusion, you do the p-value, get the probability, compare it to your level of significance. And if the p-value is less than the level of significance, and this is very unusual. I have to reject what I thought was the standard truth there, that the distributions were the same. And I say, explaining it to someone who asks me, there's sufficient evidence that these distributions are not the same. Now that may be a little bit unexpected. Let's look back at our chart. Zero, one, two, three, four plus. I want you to see those numbers side by side again. What we observed was 66, 119, 340, 60, and 15. What we expected by the national survey was 60, 96, 330, 66, and 48 out of 600 in each case. Check that out. Our test told us that these distributions are very different. And it seems to have come down to those two numbers, 119 and 15, being very different. Only a third of the households had four or more televisions. Now, this was admittedly a lot of writing. And if I had more categories, you'd be like nervous to have to write all this down, right? So let me show you how to enter this into your calculator. Let's go to the screen calculator and compare how I could do it automatically with the screen calculator or even automatically with a test function. So let me find my screen calculator for you and share it. Sharing my screen calculator, let me clear these two or at least turn them off so I don't look at those graphs. Let us go to our statistics window. And add these two lists to the statistics window. Now I've got two different lists here. So first of all, I'm going to have to clear these. 
Well, there's a faster way to clear more than one list at a time, but I'll have to show it to you later. So let's enter the frequency that I observed first, 66, 119, 340, 60, and 15. Then let's enter the distribution that I expected, 60, 96, excuse me, 96, 330, 66, and 48. So let me show you how to create a list number three that takes these two differences and then squares them and then divides by the expected value in list two. Let's go over to list three, put your cursor on list three at the top and now hit enter. So I'll say, let's take list one, the observed minus list two, the expected. And let's square that. And then let's divide it by list two. And this will do that calculation that I wrote on the paper out with all five terms automatically. There we go. Now, let me add these five numbers. But again, being naturally lazy, I don't wanna write them down and add them. I want the calculator to add them. So let me get this screen over here. Get the table in front of you. I don't have the table right there. Let's get the stat plot in front of you. I don't have the stat plot right there. Let's get the window in front of you. I don't have the window. Okay, I don't want think I can show both of these at the same time, but let's show you how to add these up automatically. So let's go back to our home screen and clear that home screen. And under math or list, I can get this command called sum, number five. I could sum list three. So what's the sum of list three? Oops, that does not look good. Oh, I know why it doesn't look good because well, I was supposed to be summing list three, wasn't I? Something is wrong because I don't have 302. Let's go back to my stats window. Ah, oh, do you see this 272? I have 330 here, but I should have entered 340 here. So always double check your entries. So let's put in 340 there. But the problem is that doesn't change the 272 right away. So what I got to do is go delete this three and do it over again. List one minus list two squared divided by list two. Now I have these numbers adjusted. Now let's go and quit and go back and sum list three again. So just to show you again, sum was under list, math, five, sum list three. I could have just did second function entry. There's my 296464. Now I could put that under a chi-square distribution. What, chi-square distribution of four degrees of freedom? Sorry, I destroyed that. Let's put the chi-square distribution of four degrees of freedom right there. But this is a little bit awkward to draw the distribution and then check this area. First of all, because I've got to get my own window sized correctly. Remember I had a bad window here. So if I want a mean of four, maybe I should run this from zero to 10. And I think I have to run it Y value higher than five higher than 0.05, let's make 0.5. Let's see that 
means I have to draw this window myself. Let's make the y scale minus 0 0.05 count by, excuse me, let's make the y scale, I got to use the minus key on the bottom, minus 0 0.05. Let's make it 0 .0, 0 0.1 and make that a one, two there. Okay, graph. Uh, I have no X scale here. Let's look at my X scale. I don't want to go from zero to 10 counting by tens. Let's go from zero to 10 counting by ones. See the trouble is I have to draw this curve myself. And now let's shade the area from 29 on well, that's ridiculous. The window stops at 10. I'm going to have to blow this window all the way out to 40 or something. Not four, excuse me, 40. And then add up all the area from 29 onwards. Twenty nine point six four six four to forty. Well, not only can I not see it, but you see the area is point five seven times ten to the negative six. It is the same as I had before. I can only not see it. I don't have a very good graph here. <coughs> There's no hope of seeing what I shaded. So let me show you. There's the table version, how to do it on the calculator under the lists. But let me show you how to do it with a test menu under stats. Stats, test. Let's slide down till I get the chi-squared test, which is right here. There's two. We want the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And I've already put my observed values into L1, my expected values into L2, and the degrees of freedom I have to set to be four. But now I can calculate this. There's my 5.7 times 10 to the negative six. There's my chi-squared test statistic, 29.6464, degrees of freedom four. But I can also draw it. Go down to the chi-square goodness of fit test. And here when I draw it, the calculator will draw it for me in a window with appropriate sizing. I'm still not going to see any area. That's the chi-squared I drew. This is the calculator resizing it. But do you notice how the 29.6464, this is still what if I want to trace this? It didn't even draw up to 29. I guess I can continue out here to 29. But when I shade this, it's going to be so small that I don't even see it. I'll have to try something I can see. Uh, little trick is to use the up arrow key to get to the goodness of fit test faster. Yeah, 0 0.00000576 is a very, very small number. That's why we rejected the, hypo the uh, null hypothesis. Okay. So there's sufficient evidence that these distributions are not the same. Now, you can use the goodness of fit test to compare anything you observe to anything you expect. But there is one rule you have to follow. Let me go back to my paper so I can write this down. In each category, the expected value must be at least 
5. I could observe anything. I could observe anything unusual, but the expected value has to be at least 5. So let me do another experiment with you. Let's say that I had a deck of cards that I had altered. And here's a standard deck of cards I'm holding under the camera. And it's got 26 red cards and 26 black cards. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, that I took out 10 black cards. There's six black cards I've taken out. Here's four more black cards. Let's say I take 10 black cards and remove them from the deck. Now I have 42 cards. And remember, a standard deck is 52. And how many reds do I have? 26. And how many blacks do I have? 16. So this almost looks like a full deck. And in fact, if I told you, here's a deck of 42 cards, you'd expect them to be equal numbers, red and black, unless I warned you. But let's say I had a deck of 42 cards here and I lied to you and told you that they were equal red and black. Let's say that you expected 21 red cards and 21 black cards. And now let's play a game where I start pulling cards. Oh, that's a black card. You win $5. Oh, it's a black card. You win $5. Oh, it's a black card. You win $5. See, you think you're betting on whether the card comes up red or black and there's equal number of red cards and black cards. You saw me, I'm a terrible shuffler. You saw me remove 10 black cards. Let's try again. Oh, there's a red card. You get to give me back $5. Oh, there's a red card. You got to give me back $5. You see what I'm going to do with these 42 cards? I'll play a game for you. Let's cut the cards and every time it comes up red, I win $5 and every time it comes up black, you win $5. Now let's do this ten times. Or let's do this. 20 times or 30 times. How would you know when you were being cheated? You expect 21 cards each, right? So I don't want to do this 42 times. That would take a very long time to play that game. Let's just cut the deck 10 times and count observed red and observed black. So red, black, observed, expected. How many times do you expect to win? How many times do you expect to turn over a black card? Five times. How many times do you expect to lose? You expect to turn over a red card five times. Now my expected columns each have five elements in it, so I can use this test. So let's cut the deck 10 times. Black, you win. I'll just count them. 
Now you're nervous about how I'm cutting the deck. Maybe I should shuffle them too. Okay, red, I win. But I don't have time to shuffle necessarily. Let's cut it. Red, I win. Black, you win. Black, you win. Now we've played the game five times. You won three out of five times, even though you have far fewer black cards in this deck. Red, I win. Red, I win. Red, I win. Red, I win. Let's do one more cut. Black, you win. So what happened in our game? I won six times. I got $5 each time, so that's $30. You won four times. You got four times five, $20. So I walked away with $10. And you're not sure if I had a loaded deck. You know, six to four is pretty close. But I know I had a loaded deck. I know I had far more red cards than black cards. I have 26 red cards and 16 black cards in this deck of 42 cards. Can you tell that I was cheating though? Because your absurd value is six and absurd value is four blacks. Let's do the test. What's the difference? Six minus five squared over five plus four minus five squared over five. Now, what is that? One over five plus one over five. What do you got right that? Two over five, which is 0 0.40. That's your p-value, that's your test statistic. Now let's do chi-squared distribution with how many degrees of freedom? This is one degree of freedom because they have two categories. Now chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom, it looks kind of funny, let me show it to you. It's seriously bent. So chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom looks like this. Oh, I gotta get a good window in front of me. Remember it's got a standard deviation, or it's got a mean of one. So let's look at the window. Let's run this from uh, zero to five. Graphing. Chi-square distribution is seriously slanted towards the right. In fact, I don't even see the top of it. Where is the top of this? The chi-square distribution for a degree of freedom one is very, very different than the others. So let's look at this window and run this window from minus one, sorry. Let's run this window from minus one to 10 heights, count by ones. Y min minus one, Y max 10, count by ones. Okay, now I get some idea of the height of this. I didn't need to go to 10, three would have been sufficient. Let's make it three. So this is seriously bent to the right. Now what's my test statistic? From two fifths, which was 0 0.40 on, let's calculate the area from 0 0.4 onwards to the right-hand side, which I set at five. There's all that area there. And it actually eats up a significant portion of the graph. What does it eat up? It eats up 50% of that graph. So your p-value 
I'll go back to my paper. Your p-value in this experiment is 0 0.5. Let me read it off my calculator again. 0 0.17. And level of significance, if we keep that level of significance at 5%, And what do I got right here? 50% is way bigger than 5%. So I do not reject the null hypothesis. What was the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis would be these distributions are the same. There's so little difference between them you know you were getting cheated because you saw the deck loaded with red cards. But since I only won by a little bit, you're not certain that you got cheated. This fact that you lost two more times than you won, as far as you're concerned, there was a 50-50 chance of that. So you could happily play this game with me over and over again, still losing each time or losing most times. Maybe sometimes you get lucky and win money and you wouldn't necessarily know the deck was loaded. So this is the problem if you only have a few trials. Now let's say we played this game a hundred times. I'm going to go back to my paper here. And let's say that I have 42 card deck. And let's say you expect that there's 21 red cards and 21 black cards. So let's say 26 red cards. 16 black cards. And let's play the game 100 times. I cannot cut the cards in front of you 100 times. So I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say you lost 65 times and you only won 35 times. I'm wondering what 26 out of 42 is on a calculator, right? Let's take 26 divided by 42. See, with that deck stacked, I should be winning 62 games. That's the theoretical probability. Let's say you won 60, let's say, let's change this, observe to, I won 62 games and I lost 38 games out of 100. Can you tell whether you're being cheated now? Oh. Or maybe you're just having like a, very bad day. Now, if we play the game 100 times, I have to say the expected number of reds and expected number of blacks is 50 each time, right? So let's calculate 62 minus 50. We'll still do this by hand, square it. Let's calculate 38 minus 50. We'll do that by hand, square it. Divided by the expected values of 50 and expected value of 50. This will be our test statistic. Remember, I'm adding up the observed values minus the expected values, each one squaring it and divided by the expected values. Expected values in both cases were 50. But this is 12 squared, which is 144 over 50. And this is 12 squared, minus 12 this time. 144 over 50. So now I got 288 over 50. Now let's look at this statistic. 288 divided by 50 
is 0 0.5, sorry. Let's, I just show it to you in the calculator. Don't try to do it in my head casually. 288 divided by 50 is 5.76. Now let's look at the area under that curve from 5.76 onwards. Well, let's do it on the calculator. So go to my calculator. Instead of same degree of freedom, instead of 0.5, let's look from five onwards. That's got to be tiny. Let's look under my goodness of fit test. I don't want to put those two into there. Let's say I could put, yeah. Let's say I could put those into the stats menu. Let's edit. And I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to get rid of this. OK, excuse me. I'm not showing you the calculator screen for some reason. I didn't show the calculator screen. Let's delete that. And let's delete. Oh, do you see the difference between clearing and deleting? I actually deleted list two, which I did not want to do. So how do I get? If you accidentally delete a list, someone asked me this very early in the course, you could set up the editor again. And then you'll get all your lists back. OK, I'm getting out of time here, but let's clear this. I'll show this to you very quickly. So I won 62 times. You won 38 times. We expected, or you expected, I knew the deck was loaded. You expected 50 wins each. Let's go to our goodness of fit test. Observed L1, expected L2, degrees of freedom one, because there's only two outcomes, red or black. Look at that. The chance that you lose 62 times out of 100, if it was a fair deck, is less than 2%. So in this situation on the paper, now you know something is wrong because we played a lot of games. You lost 62 times. But that p-value above 5.76 in the chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom is 0 0.016. If we take our level of significance to be 0 0.05, that p-value is less than 0 0.05, noticeably less. So now I reject H0. And what was H0? That these two distributions could be from the same distribution, that they could be the same. You are seriously thinking that that deck is not 21 cards red and 21 cards black. Remember, you thought the deck was fair. But actually, I was hiding from you that the deck was stacked. OK, you can actually use this in games of chance and things like that except you got to use it at a more sophisticated level than this. You know, what if in a poker game, I don't want to imitate the old Western movies, right? But in the poker game, in the Western movies, what happens? Someone always gets an ace when they need one, right? And then there's a gunfight. So how many times do you expect that ace to come up? Well, wow, there's only four aces in the deck out of 52 cards. That's one out of 13 times. But someone gets a little bit too lucky. Right? So you can, this is an example of how you could determine if someone got a little bit too lucky. Of course, you have to have your calculator with you at the poker table or so on and so forth. Okay, I'm not applying this to poker here. 
But this game that I played here and I demonstrated on the calculator is called a goodness of fit test. Let me show you the drawing on the calculator before we leave. So I kept you a little bit longer here, but stat, test, goodness of fit test. This time, instead of calculating, I'll draw it. The calculator is drawing it here in red. And then the calculator is saying that if it shades above 5.76, it's only going to have a 1.6% chance of winning. The area under there is 1.6 area. I think I could stretch that out to 10. I could not draw this. And Let's say if I put that out to 10 and redrew that window, that goodness of fit test. Uh, I don't think the calculator is going to go out to 10 for me, is it? It'll still do the test for me, but this window right here only goes up to one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's drawing the window it wants to draw, not the window I want it to draw. Okay, I'm gonna cut it off right there. Next time we'll use the chi-squared test in a different manner. It's called, it's similar, but not the same. It's called a test for independence. How do you know if two things really depend on each other or if multiple things depend on each other? And that'll require us to use a calculator at an even higher level. So bring your calculators next time. I'm going to say goodbye and catch you next time. Sorry to keep you overly long here, just right up to the two o'clock window. But there's a lot of things you can demonstrate with this distribution, the chi-squared distribution. Get your test together. If you have a question about the test, as you're getting it together, send it to me. I'll answer it if I can. Remember, your test is due Tuesday, April 6th at 11.59 p.m. I'll see you next time.